Hello, everyone. It's uh, John Lockland here, Director of FBD International. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, Vanessa, I think you're online. I think you can hear me. Uh, yes, I can hear you, John. Vanessa, it's really nice to uh, to talk to you. Uh, we'll be, <laughs> we'll be uh, joined in a minute by Jeremy Nell, our, our co-host. Um, oh, great. Uh, and um, he's going to, uh, he and I hope Peter Lavella as well will join us. Um, Wonderful. Vanessa, you and I, uh, I can't remember when we met. Uh, you didn't come to uh, IDC in Paris, did you? Yes, I did. You did, you I, did. Came, I came and gave a talk there from memory yeah. on President Trump in Syria. Right, yes. Uh, probably, was, uh, was, did you come with uh, <laughs> Mother Agnes? Because we worked a lot with her. Um, no, I didn't. I can't, you were going to ask me which year I came. No, I honestly can't remember. I remember that Alan Corvez was there. Yes. Uh, and um, he was also speaking yeah. from memory. But no, it wasn't with Mother Agnes, okay. although obviously I'm still in touch with her. So for the benefit of our listeners, Vanessa Bili is an independent journalist uh, based in Damascus in Syria. She's been um, extremely active on the Syrian question for uh, what's probably now, I don't know, nearly 10 years. I mean, we can't, rem um, we can't remember now when, yeah. when you came to Paris, but uh, my, my recollection, I, I, I don't remember the year, I could have looked it up, I suppose, but my recollection, it was one of, my, one of the earliest experiences for me of understanding the level of media manipulation. We held an event in Paris, but perhaps not the one you came to, uh, mm. relatively early on in the, in the Syrian civil war. Uh, or whatever you call it. Um, <clears throat> so let's say it would have been in 2012, 2013, not right at the beginning, but but uh, but it was definitely before the proclamation of the Islamic State in 2014. Right. And uh, we uh, uh, brought, uh, or my Russian colleagues invited a um, very talented um, war reporter, a girl, a woman, Mm. Uh, who had, uh, by the way, been injured in, injured in the in the course of her reporting, and she showed mm. us uh, images of horrific. I mean, absolutely horrific. In fact, I couldn't watch them. I'm very squeamish. But they were they were literally horrific. Uh, I remember, for instance, a, a video of a child, uh, maybe a ten year old boy, uh, being taught to murder somebody with a with a sword or something. I mean, absolutely yeah. mind boggling stuff. And all this, wow. uh, all this video material was uh, being broadcast at that point on Russian TV, uh, because of course uh, the Russians understood uh, very early on the nature of the Syrian rebellion. But um, it was completely invisible to anyone in the West. Nobody knew anything about this, and instead they were Democrats and liberals and all the rest of it. And it was only when the Islamic State was proclaimed that suddenly they turned from being, not all of them, of course, but they turned, some of them turned from being amazing Jeffersonian Democrats into evil Islamist uh, terrorists. Uh, and it was, <laughs> it, it, was uh, it was particularly striking for me because, of course, an image, uh, a, a video or whatever, a photograph, can be transmitted in uh, at the, the flick of a click, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a microsecond. Yeah. And yet, mm. with Syria, as later with Ukraine, uh, there were essentially two parallel universes. It was particularly striking in the case of Ukraine, but I suspect if you were based in Syria at the time, it was probably just as striking for you. There were literally two parallel universes, uh, two different narratives, which which simply never uh, interacted. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and that was that was what I remember from those early years of the Syrian civil war. I expect that's your oh, experience absolutely. as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've only been coming here actually since 2015. Prior to that, I was um, in and out of Gaza during uh, an Israeli aggression in 2012. And then 2013 started to, to follow because I had to come back to France at that point. And I started to follow the Syrian case um, and fully understood, uh, you know, what was going on. Uh, tried to come here in 2015 and eventually managed to get here in 2016. So basically since uh, July 2016, I've been coming uh, literally every two, maximum three months for about two weeks at a time. 
So to most of the front lines, including um, the liberation of the eastern districts of Aleppo in December, November, December 2016. And there in particular, um, because I and people like Eva Bartlett, other journalists on the ground, there were not many, by the way, who were actually on the ground reporting um, the facts as they really were. Um, but we had been talking about the situation in Aleppo for some time. And we were only vindicated, of course, after the liberation by the Syrian Arab army and allies, including uh, Russia and the Palestinian factions, um, many of whom had their homes in those eastern districts. And they led the spearhead of the liberation campaign. Many people don't know that. Uh, and I remember, I mean, I remember Owen Jones, I think, in The Guardian, putting out this story that the Syrian Arab army soldiers were entering the eastern districts and raping women and kidnapping children. Um, I, I mean, and I was literally on the streets at the time. Uh, and, and so, yes, I, I can't describe it any better than to say it is literally like a parallel universe. And it still is. You know, the media has not really deviated from its narrative that began even before 2011. Um, it's not deviated, and so it becomes even more surreal now with the normalization with Syria and President Assad in the Arab world, and yet the Western uh, regimes and their aligned media are continuing <laughs> with the same narratives. I mean, they simply don't deviate from them. It's quite extraordinary. I should add, so, yes, should it, add it, uh, for our listeners that one of Vanessa Bealy's most uh, impressive achievements, uh, well, I don't know, maybe you've got more than I'm aware of, but certainly the one I'm aware of is your absolutely superb, um, uh, 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 what's the word, uh, discrediting uh, and, re and revelations about the white helmets, the, the famous white helmets. Mm. I've, I've given lectures about this. I, I, I run I courses know. on media and media manipulation and uh, I, show mm. the, <clears throat> I show my students the images of the white helmets and I I show them, you know, 10 or 15 photographs of men in white helmets carrying babies uh, out of, uh, you know, rubble and so on. <laughs> and I and I say to them, I say, I ask them two questions. I say, first of all, where is the photographer? Uh, because obviously, mm. that, if there's a photograph, that means there's a photographer uh, on hand to take the picture. And then I say, what else do you notice about these pictures? And of course, the answer is that they're all identical. In other words, the white helmet, the role of the white helmets, apart mm. from its uh, military or paramilitary role, uh, perhaps its primary role was to create a narrative. It was to create a, a series of images uh, and to create a narrative. And after all, they were nominated, I think, for an Oscar for the Netflix documentary about them. Yes, and they were nominated again in 2017 for the uh, film, uh, Last Men in Aleppo, which I've done a fairly um, in-depth report on, I actually went to the White Helmet Center in Al Ansari in Aleppo where it was filmed. Again, it was a center that was shared uh, with Nusra Front, which is Al-Qaeda in Syria, and uh, next door there were ISIS logos on the various buildings. So, so you know, effectively, again, the White Helmets were embedded in an area um, where the terrorist groups were operating and they were working in, in collaboration. And actually in that particular White Helmet Center uh, in Mashhad Square, which is only about 200 meters walking away, uh, is where Nour al-Din Zinki, the US-backed so-called moderate rebel group, uh, beheaded the child Abdullah Issa in uh, August 2016. So the White Helmets were literally 200 meters away from a war crime that was being committed and did not intervene. Um, and also you mentioned, you know, th their role was to stage the events that maintained the criminalization of the Syrian government and therefore enabled uh, the continued uh, intervention by Western states by proxy, by terrorist proxy. But in 2017, there was a British uh, government, a UK Foreign Office document that actually stated that the White Helmet's role was to corroborate, and I'm, I'm quoting, I may be paraphrasing slightly, but I've, I've read it so many times, 
that their role was to corroborate UK foreign policy in Syria. And, and the wording of that was quite extraordinary to me because what that said for me, that the, the foreign policy was to be corroborated by this organization, not that the organization was to provide information that would then influence UK foreign policy, if you see what I mean. So the foreign policy came first and the White Helmets would corroborate that policy, which was effectively regime change. And then of course, fast forward to 2018 and you had the Duma alleged chemical uh, incident again, I was in Damascus at the time. I had visited various terrorist uh, chemical labs and munitions factories in, in the surrounding areas the day before um, with actually Frederick Leitgen from CNN who didn't like to be questioned as to why he didn't mention this when he reported on the alleged chemical attack the day later. Um, and, you know, the White Helmets were proven even by a BBC producer, Riam Zalati, that they had staged the hospital scenes at the medical point uh, in Duma, and that they had effectively, um, you know, staged, managed a chemical weapon attack. And I was actually told by civilians in the area that one month previously, they had attempted to do the same thing, but the civilians themselves had actually rather um, unwittingly derailed it by coming on the streets to, to celebrate the, the liberation of the area where they were. So, so they had to kind of curtail um, their chemical weapon uh, scenery at that point. Um, I'm very keen for our co-hosts to uh, intervene and I'm sure they will in a minute. Jeremy, do you sure. want to go ahead? I've got, I've got plenty of questions, but I, I'm not going to hold the show. Go ahead. <laughs> Jeremy in Cape Town. Sorry, I thought I had my microphone on. Hi Vanessa, nice to chat to you. It's Hi, good. nice to see you again. Sir, I'll speak to you again, not see you. <laughs> yes, yes, it's an it's a, an imaginary video. This time. <laughs> um, Vanessa, I was mm. wondering where where do you think this animosity towards Assad and Syria um, started? Not just where, but also uh, sorry, not just when, but also where, um, because there's this incredible campaign from the West or from mm. the Anglo the Anglo American sphere. Uh, yeah. which 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 seems to unless I've got it wrong, but it seems to have accelerated since nine eleven more or less yes, um I mean, I would argue that the animosity against Syria began after their um independence from French mandate in nineteen forty six and I've written about this extensively so seventy five years basically um which was an attempt by the West to prevent the strong relationship that they had with the Soviet Union and then obviously later with Russia and that's where um, Bashar al-Assad comes into the picture but and, even and prior Iran, to Iran, 2000 Vanessa. yes absolutely but but I think the the relationship with with Russia is to a large degree more important particularly to the UK um, the UK has a has a really particularly vindictive policy in in Syria, and I don't know if you remember. I think in 2018 there were leaked diplomatic documents, um, and and I'm going to forget who was the British um, protagonist in those documents or those email exchanges. I think it was Ben Norman, um, and they were talking about the priority was to basically cut the, the cord between uh, Russia and Syria. So this has been, you know, for them, the threat is that Russia obviously has had a military base in Syria for the last 50 years um, and is clearly as a result of the West's interference in Syria, it is increasing its military footprint uh, inside Syria. I won't say that it's behaving in the way that the US or the UK or the EU does. Um, you know, Damascus has sovereignty, Damascus has the last word and has sometimes been extremely frustrating for Russia, but Russia effectively does respect the sovereignty uh, of Syria and that's an important point to make. But coming back to, to uh, Bashar al-Assad, if you look pre to, prior to 2009, I challenge you to find any negative commentary about Bashar al-Assad. In 2009, of course, what did he do? He made the decision to go with um, the Iranian pipeline uh, as opposed to the Qatari pipeline, which was uh, backed by the US 
and that entire project began in, in 2000. Um, and uh, of course, the Iranian pipeline is backed by Russia. So that was really the final straw amongst others. I mean, you had uh, in 2004, Assad launched the, the four C's that then became the five C's project that was looking at creating a multipolar world. <laughs> Where have we heard that before? Um, using the Belt and Road Initiative with China, but linking Syria basically to the global south and then into um, Europe. So that was a very important point also. And of course, he refused to back down on support for uh, Palestine, for Hezbollah, uh, his alliance with Iran, as you mentioned. There were a huge number of things that culminated in 2009. British officials meeting with the then Foreign Minister Roland Dumas and basically informing him that they were going to uh, back armed insurgents uh, in Syria uh, and basically was he on board. I think he finally <clears throat> spoke about that in 2013. So there's a very long history of animosity towards Syria and towards particularly pan-Arabism and towards the kind of the Ba'ath uh, party uh, socialist ethic. Mm. Vanessa, um, I, I recently did a, a podcast in which <laughs> I spoke about um, Gaddafi and you mentioned um, Pan-Arabism mm -hmm. and uh, yes. he was also a strong supporter of um, Pan-Africanism. Do, yes. do you think that the two can work together as we head into an emerging multipolarity? Absolutely. I mean, you know, you're seeing it now in Gaddafi, my goodness. I mean, Libya was one of the most developed progressive nations in Africa before uh, NATO intervention. The same with Syria. If you look at Syria, if you speak to Peter Ford, the former British ambassador to Syria, uh, I think he left uh, in 2006. Um, he will describe Assad and Syria as progressive, reformist, secular, fiercely secular. You know, that's why it's crazy that all of these sectarian narratives that are being promulgated by Western media just don't work here. Um, and yes, I think that's what we're seeing. You know, the normalization now between Syria and Arab states is effectively the reemergence of pan-Arabism. I mean, you're in South Africa, I think, aren't you, Jeremy? So, yes, I mean, I yes. guess I would ask yes, you. South Africa. Yeah, if, if you see the possibility for um, Pan-Arabism re-emerging. I am seeing it. I am seeing uh, African state leaders definitely sort of coming out now more in favor um, of a world without <laughs> U.S. hegemony um, and, and oppression, basically. Yeah, the reason why I was asking that is because I know that the Anglo-American um, <clears throat> perspective of Pan-Africanism is very similar to its perspective of Pan-Arabism, which is why mm. I think there is a there's a strong connect between, let's say, Gaddafi and and Assad. Absolutely, yes, definitely. And I mean, you know, they they were working together, and that and that why is why. Sorry, of course, there was um, you know confrontation with and criminalization of Gamal Abdul Nasser. Um, you know, and my father was very much involved in, in this. Oh, from Egypt. Passenger. Yeah, mm. because, of course, he was working with Hafez al-Assad on um, the United Arab Republic. That was, that was the previous name of the Syrian Arab Republic. Um, and, uh, you know, the West's uh, uh, contention w with NASA was over this. I mean, the last thing that they wanted was a, was a united... Uh, Africa or a united uh, Arab world uh, basically having access to their own resources and that in my view is very much what we're seeing now we're seeing the formation of effectively a commodity block we're seeing all of the commodity um, um, owning countries coming together under the, the kind of the Russian China umbrella. That's very much what I'm seeing. And now in the Arab world, um, with Saudi Arabia normalizing relations uh, with Syria, um, the UAE, Qatar is still uh, a little out in the cold. Um, 
then we're saying that that formation of a commodities block and that i think is what what you know terrified the west that these countries would have control and be able to nationalize their own resources <laughs> we, um there is a uh, a dutch uh dimension to the syrian issue and the white helmets <laughs> uh, which i'll come on to in a minute if there's time but uh, i know that our co-host yeah. michael van der Gallien wants to speak uh, Michael, I sure. think you are in Turkey, is that right? Or you're the editor of the Daily Standard in the Netherlands, but are you, you're in Turkey at the moment, is that it? Well, actually, I'm uh, at the moment in the Netherlands, but I will go, be going back to Turkey again next week. Um, so, yeah, thank you, John. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to respond to something you said. I think it's very mm. interesting, Vanessa, what you're uh, telling us about uh, Syria, but I'd like to go back a little bit further because you said basically before 2009, it's very difficult to find anything negative coming from mm -hmm. the West about Syria or Assad. But actually, I think uh, it was George W. Bush who had the infamous Axis of Evil speech. And he, yes. in 2005, I remember, he had a speech in which he literally called out Syria for harboring terrorists. And uh, in his own book, Cheney said that in 2007, he actually tried to convince Bush to bomb Syria already. Yes. So it actually goes back even further than 2009. And oh, sure. Yeah. 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 In fact, in, sorry, just to interrupt a second. In 2005, I think, was the interview between uh, Christian Armanpour and President Assad, where she actually intimated that regime change might be on the books. And uh, there was an article in Time magazine, uh, Syria in Bush's crosshairs, where Bush was already talking about arming uh, insurgents uh, in uh, Syria. And of course, there are multiple uh, CIA uh, documents that were released by WikiLeaks showing that the CIA historically has weaponized the Muslim Brotherhood factions inside Syria um, to carry out coup d'etat or, or destabilization projects. So, yeah, yeah. But what I meant was in, in, in the general media or in academia, for example. And, and remember in 2002, uh, Tony Blair was offering or proposing a knighthood um, for uh, Bashar al-Assad. And there are the documents, uh, the shared emails between Bush and Tony Blair that actually talk about trying to uh, foment a different relationship with Syria. Um, in other words, to try and bring Syria on board rather than bomb it, as they had done, obviously, with uh, Iraq. So, yes, I agree with you. It, it, I would say, I would also argue it started way back, uh, as I mentioned, uh, even after 1946. There has been a continuous uh, line of coup d'etat and clandestine ops and military ops and so on um, inside Syria to to destabilize and to try and um, bring Syria under control. It's pretty incredible right. to think that uh, we're in a time now where <laughs> Tony Blair is regarded as a dove <laughs> and a proponent of multi <laughs> of a multipolar world. Oh God! Well, no, I I, I wouldn't go that far. Well, he is. He, no, he, in comparison to there's an article in the Guardian this morning saying oh, that Ukraine really? that Ukraine protested back in I can't remember <gasps> 2005 or something that uh, uh, Blair was too friendly with with Putin and some such nonsense so it just shows that the, the trajectory yeah. has been so intense um I want to bring in uh, yeah. Peter Lavelle um who's joining us uh, who's our co-host from Moscow Peter go ahead Vanessa it's really great to hear your voice again and you Peter lovely I you haven't know, spoken to you for a long time I, I, I such a pr appreciate your hard work, uh, particularly on Syria. And listening to you talk over, I joined a few minutes late, but almost every time you said Syria, you could actually put Ukraine in at that sentence. It's remarkable. Yeah. The it, it's, it's remarkable how unimaginative these elites are. <laughs> yeah. When, when they just pick their next target. And because everything you just said about Syria, been, it's been going on in Ukraine, and it's been going on for a very long time, particularly since 2014. Have you reflected upon the parallels? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, as you said, and also the parallels, even if we go back to um, NATO intervention in former Yugoslavia, yep. that was pretty yep. much where the blueprint was established. And let's not forget that the uh, James Le, Le Mazurier, who was the founder, basically, of the White Helmets, although they're trying desperately to distance themselves a little bit from him now, 
Um, but he was in Kosovo in 1999 and he was rebranding the KLA, Al Qaeda and Albanian warlords into the Kosovo Security Corps. While, of course, they were organ tra uh, cross uh, border organ trafficking, uh, particularly Serbian children. So, so, you know, the history started way back there and the blueprint started way back there. And I think he even admitted that in one interview um, with Georgetown University from memory. He actually made the connection himself between uh, Kosovo and what was happening or what his role was uh, in Syria. So you're absolutely right. And the thing is that they they have a sort of a blueprint and they don't seem to be able to, to deviate. Heaven forbid they actually negotiate and, and head towards peace. They just have this continuous war blueprint and that's what they rely on. And, and no, it hasn't changed in Ukraine. That's why it's so sort of eminently recognizable. Sorry, I've, yes, yeah. and, and, and also, if I could just follow up, also the, the, <laughs> the common denominator is always Russia. It's always a way to contain Russia because yep. you can, you can, there's no one uh, with any common sense that can make a, um, uh, a case that uh, American intervention in or dirty proxy war in Syria is in the national interest. The same thing, you, you cannot make a convincing case that involvement in Ukraine is in the national interest. <laughs> the interest is is to make sure a, a multipolar world does not come into being. The problem with exactly. the people in Brussels and in Washington, uh, <laughs> in Warsaw and a few other places that they just can't come to terms that the multipolar world is already here. Yes. Absolutely, and that's what I'm saying about the, the re-emergence of pan-Arabism. Um, and of course, what is, what is the US now trying to do? It's bringing in the Captagon Act, it's bringing in the uh, anti-normalization with Bashar al-Assad, which is effectively an extension of the, the Caesar sanctions that were brought in under the Trump administration. So in, in it, what it will do is punish any country um, that comes to the aid of uh, Syria to, to a level above, I think it's $50,000. I might need to check that. Um, so, you know, they are, they are actually uh, completely deranged at the moment is, is the only way that I can describe Western policy. There is absolutely no um, rationale, logic, morality. There, there is nothing integrity, nothing. It is literally just a, a sort of a deranged power grab or a deranged uh, attempt to keep the power that they've accumulated over the years, which of course is based upon piracy. If we look at Syria, the US occupation in the Northeast, they are effectively stealing 80% of Syrian oil. We have no electricity. We have no fuel. We have temperatures of 50 degrees at the moment, or it's rising to 50, it's 48 today. Um, and we have, many people here have about half an hour electricity per day. So there's no air conditioning. We've had huge fires in Damascus. We had Israel attack the early hours of this morning. Again, something that is never mentioned or, or you know, if it is mentioned, it's mentioned without any outrage at all when Israel bombs effectively residential areas in Syria on a regular basis. So that's what the West is about. It's, it's, it's not about partnership. It's about the destruction of a sovereign nation in order to plunder its resources. I think, yeah, Michael, I think that's, uh, yeah. Uh, last thing. Sorry. I, I, think it, I think it's just very curious, uh, and, and this is, I, I want maybe John Lachlan can react to this, but we have this, this uh, neoliberal um, uh, postmodernist ideology coming out of the West. But what it, what's really peculiar about it is also a new peculiar form of neo-colonialism. It's very interesting how they could be easily married, but the media mm. will never make that dissection. Yes, no, absolutely, I agree with you. Um, yeah. and, and, and there's this sort of um, tranche well, of... Li li Sorry, liberal, ideas, uh, liberal ideas have always uh, been in the service of colonialism. This is mm -hmm. often something that's not understood. Mm -hmm. I mean, Vanessa mm -hmm. mentioned, for instance, uh, uh, you mentioned very briefly, Vanessa, that it went back to the French mandate in 1946, mm. the end of the French mandate. <clears throat> One of the biggest causes of tensions between Britain and France, who after all were close allies in the Second World War, was uh, indeed the fate of Syria and Lebanon. Because mm. uh, Britain said, London said uh, Syria and Lebanon must become independent. 
and uh, Paris said, well, what about Iraq? What about, uh, what about Palestine? Because Britain wanted to hold on to its uh, mandate territories, uh, but uh, wanted to force France uh, wanted to force France to make them independent. Uh, and mm. yet the British uh, argued that a totally hypocritical position uh, in the name of liberalism. But, you know, you, you can also go back to the 19th century. Liberalism has always been uh, sorry. Imperialism has always been or very often been accompanied with by by liberalism. So there's no there's no contradiction. Uh, you know, the yeah. opium wars with China were, were allegedly, you know, in support of free trade and so on. Um, M Michael van der Gallian, I know you wanted to say something about the Turkey's <laughs> role in the Syrian yeah. uh, conflict. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I want to say something about Turkey's role because in mm. tur in Turkey itself, it is quite a controversial subject what Turkey has been doing there. And yeah. if you if if you look like before 2011, I guess uh, Turkey was very supportive of Assad. They had a good relationship with each other, mm. uh, unlike the West. Right, the West was already talking badly about Assad for a long time. Yeah, but Turkey wasn't. They were really allies almost, and that changed in 2011 when it became more chaotic there. It's in, mm. I always try to figure out, and other Turks also try to figure out, what the Turkish <laughs> government wants exactly, right? And on the one hand, it's clear they want to create a buffer zone because of the PKK, the, the Kurdish uh, terrorist organizations. So that's understandable, I think, from a, from a geopolitical political perspective. You want to create this buffer zone. You want to make sure that those organizations can't come into Turkey that easily. On the other hand, what the result of this pol these policies is also that there is a lot of chaos in Syria, and that increases chances of terrorism. It and it creates, make, you know, in, enormous problems for Turkey itself with an influx of Syrians of Syrian refugees. Turkey can't handle it. A lot of mm. Turks are becoming very anti-immigration right now, very anti-Arab mm -hmm. even. They don't want to have the Arabs in the streets anymore. The Syrians not anymore. And mm. so, my my question towards you is. What do you think that Turkish goals, Turkey's goals are exactly? Because I'm trying to figure it out. I can figure it out partially, but I can not give a straight up answer and say, yeah, they want to create chaos because, because chaos is a problem for themselves. The only buffer zone for the PKK, for the Kurds, I can understand that. But what's the other goals of Turkey in, in Syria? Well, I mean, I think uh, the idea of the buffer zone, there was always, I can't remember, it's just gone from my memory, the agreement that was made in 99 between Syria and Turkey, you probably know, um, which was basically to protect Turkey um, from, as you say, the, the terrorist organization. But that terrorist organization, let's not forget, after the US put sanctions on Syria for allegedly harboring Can anyone hear Vanessa? Nope. We've lost you, Vanessa. No, I can't hear Vanessa either. Okay, well, it, the, the, let me then add that the agreements he's talking about was in 1998, and that was the Adana agreement. Uh, the Adana is a, is a city in Turkey, and the idea was that uh, the PKK was not supposed to be active in Syria anymore, and Syria would get rid of all PKK fighters. I think Vanessa's back. Awesome. But Nessa, we could we lost you there. Can you hear us now? Can you hear? Can we hear you? No, it seems not. Listen, let's uh, go to uh, Big Boss, uh, who's asked to speak. Uh, one of our one of our listeners. Go ahead, Big Boss. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your space. I I, I had some uh, some words for Vanessa, but uh, maybe uh, she she will listen to this word later. I don't know. I would like to, to thank her uh, so much for her support to the Syrian president, to the Syrian people, and to the uh, Syrian Arab army uh, for her kindness. Uh, she is trying to give to the whole world the best picture, you know, uh, of UK, because uh, uh, she is trying to fix the mistakes of these leaders, you know. So uh, I wish to enjoy and to see one day uh, uh, the, uh, the the leaders of Vanessa, so the UK leaders, full of common sense, full of kindness, and full of uh, peace, you know, and uh, uh, no more wars, uh, no more lies, no more dirty propaganda. So I wish her the best, and I, I would like to thank her uh, very much. Uh, she's a true journalist in love with the truth and the truth, and God bless her. Thank you very much for your freedom of speech. Thank you very much. Well, that's very kind. I hope that uh, Vanessa can hear us. Um, uh, unfortunately, we can't hear her. Uh, 
<clears throat> one of the things that strikes me, and I would be very interested to hear Vanessa's view on this, and of course also that of our co-hosts, um, we, we can be, uh, we, uh, we are, I think collectively, of course, very critical about the Western role. Um, but uh, surely the fact is that uh, the Syrian, the Western role in, in Syria has lost. The West has lost in Syria. The yep. West lost in Syria. Uh, it tried to overthrow Assad. It uh, flinched. It blinked in 2013 when uh, uh, Britain and America wanted and France wanted to bomb Syria, but uh, a vote in the House of Commons uh, caused that all to unravel. And so the uh, Iraq style attack uh, never happened. And uh, in the years, in the 10 years since then, uh, with, with the exception, of course, of uh, continuing occupation in parts of Syria, the fact is that the Syrian government has won. Uh, and I've of, I always say that the Syrian war is, is a, was the first front in the war between Russia and the West. And now the second front is Ukraine. Peter, perhaps you uh, want to uh, comment on that. Peter Lavelle. I, I, absolutely. And that's why I said to Vanessa, it was, it's very interesting how um, Syria was uh, 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 the most recent uh, iteration before we came to Ukraine. Um, it, what is, I find very interesting is that the, the problem that we face right now is that you're absolutely right, John, they lost in Syria, but they don't know how to lose. And what they do is they compound the problem and they up the ante. Now, you know, I, I'm on crosstalk, you know, I've con confronted guests all the time by saying, you know, well, the U.S. can lose in Iraq, lose in Afghanistan, um, humiliate itself in Libya, but it doesn't really move the needle very much for the average Westerner. Now, there, this has changed. This is what makes Ukraine very, very different because it has real life consequences. And it shows that these people, and we, if we look at the, the architects of these conflicts, the dirty war against Syria, they're the same people that are in power today in the West, particularly in the United States when it comes to Ukraine. And so what is really terrifying for all of us is that they constantly up the ante because the outcome positive or or negative, or however you want to define what, what, you know, NATO goes around and says their intervention in the former Yugoslavia was a success. Stoltenberg says that to this day. But what it shows is that there, there's no learning process here. And it is in something that John and I have talked about for many, many years now, that it's all very ideologically driven. It's not based on, it's not, they're not, it's, they're not security um, um, uh, ideas in play here, not geopolitics, it's ideology. And you can't, you can't argue with ideology. Yeah, there's um, no cost yeah. benefit Peter. analysis and no cost benefit. Can I uh, jump in there quickly, John? Of course, Jeremy, go ahead. I, I just, yeah, just, Peter, I just want to ask you a question, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, you say that, or, or, or the comment thread earlier was that the West has lost in Syria. I find that a very intriguing comment. I'm not saying that it's not the case. But with all the destruction and, and upheaval that has occurred as a result, is that really considered a loss? I, it's certainly not a win, but I don't know if it's a loss because Syria is in a state of chaos, which I think is precisely part of the plan. Well, I, I don't disagree with you on that. I mean, um, we've, we've had uh, past U.S. officials saying, um, particularly um, um, Trump's point man in Syria, you know, the, 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 the creating a quagmire, I think, was the word that he used. Yeah, I mean, if you can't get you, you can't get complete clean regime change, then just muck up the works because it's at the end of the day, the the uh, human cost in in uh, Syria, the human cost in Ukraine is tremendous. But from a um, a air conditioned office at Foggy Bottom, it's this is you know um, uh, foreign policy on the cheap. OK, you know, the all the, the U.S. does and Europe does is just go into debt to fuel these things. OK. And and so I, I agree with you. I mean, it's it, using the words win or lose in this case is is problematic. Uh, certainly they didn't get the regime change. And because they didn't, they will do it. They will uh, go out of their way to spite the people of the country. What they're doing to Syria is just unconscionable. And as Vanessa has told us, here and, and, and over the years, it's just unconscionable that Western audiences have no idea what is being done in their name. And it's also being done now in Ukraine. If I could just say very quickly, you know, 
when they have this vitriol in the West about being anti-Russian you know, uh, and being a- against Russians. But I can tell you, living in Russia, there's an enormous amount of empathy and sympathy for Ukrainian people. The hatred isn't going both ways. And that's what makes it even more painful to watch people suffer under these regimes that are controlled by the West. These, these regimes do not act in the national interests of their own people. So again, you know, the, the terminology of win-lose, you know, I agree with you, it's problematic. I want to bring in uh, Kevork uh, Almasyan from uh, Syriana Analysis, uh, who is asked to speak. He's one of our listeners. Uh, Kevork, uh, do you agree that Syria is in a state of chaos, as Jeremy Nell suggests? I get the impression that the chaos is greatly reduced in recent years. First of all, hello for all of you. I'm from Syria, actually. I'm a journalist covering the Syrian war for a very long time, since 2011. And I have my YouTube channel, Syrian Analysis, covering the Syrian war. Uh, I think the West um, didn't succeed in Syria, but they didn't lose yet. Uh, The problem with the current situation in Syria is that one third of the country is occupied by the United States and its proxies, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Also, one of the major or important trade routes that uh, connect Syria to Jordan and Iraq uh, in a ton of border crossing is also occupied by the United States. We have the occupied Golan Heights, of course, and we have Idlib, right? In Idlib, Idlib is the largest safe haven for Al-Qaeda terrorists in the world. And now we have Turkish forces again trying to push away the Kurdish militias, like they uh, try to say. Uh, I think the major problem uh, at the moment for Syria is the reconstruction process. The reconstruction process uh, is very slow because of the unilateral coercive measures that are illegal under international law because uh, there is no mandate from the UN to sanction Syria. And they are very brutal. Actually, since 2018, uh, because we know the regime change war started from 2011 till 2017, and till 2017, Trump ended the regime change war in Syria, The what is called the uh, timber sycamore. This was the CIA-covered operation in Syria. But after 2017, they changed the strategy from a military warfare into an economic warfare. And this is strangling the Syrian economy to extent that uh, 90% of the people are below the poverty line. Uh, just for a context, before 2011, every dollar was 46 Syrian lira. Today, every dollar is 10,000 Syrian lira. So imagine the inflation in Syria and the prices skyrocketed and the people aren't able to afford food and basic necessities. The average, let's say, salaries are between 30 to $50 per month uh, and the government is only printing money uh, to feed the people, but this is causing a lot of inflation. So if we wanna fix or start fixing, in my opinion, the situation in Syria, Uh, we have to allow Syria to do trade with its neighboring countries. And this is what Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE are trying to convince the United States and the European Union. Uh, However, um, there is something very important, in my opinion, that the politicians in the uh, the United States, let's say in Washington, D.C., or in Brussels, they, they, they are infected with cultural imperialism. Their brains are still stuck in the 40s and in the 30s, they think that they have some sort of an authority over Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, or the rest of the countries in the Middle East. And they think that they have the moral superiority uh, or, and the political authority to tell us what we should, what should we do with our political system and what values we should adopt in Syria and what's the best for us. This is so, uh, this is the highest level of ignorance because they themselves do not know the Middle East well, and they haven't lived in Syria. And uh, I myself spent most of my time in Syria. I was born and raised in Syria. I'm a third generation survivor of the Armenian genocide. My grandparents escaped the Ottoman Empire to Syria. I was born and raised there. And I studied there, and I've seen how this country was um, very tolerant toward all the sects, religions, and ethnicities in Syria. There is a beautiful multiculturalism, but at the same time, there was a strong centralized government you know, that was able to create um, a social fabric that all these different ethnicities that are over 22 different religions and sects and ethnicities can coexist together. But when the central government is weakened into extent that the government cannot even feed the people, so the hegemony of the government is, has collapsed. 
and therefore every ethnicity sect or religion start to uh, isolate itself and try to act as a as a as a as a um, subgroup and this is very dangerous and this is in my opinion what the unfortunately the western governments are trying to do to divide syria on these ethnic and sectarian lines and this is why um a lot of people in syria see this conflict as a regime change war by imperialist powers and not a civil war or a so-called revolution and we have to understand from which where this mentality is coming from syrians lived the iraq war on a daily basis we followed what happened in iraq we followed what happened in libya and we have seen what is happening in palestine therefore there is a collective consciousness among the syrians that see the conflict in Syria as an external warfare against them that they have to resist. However, between 2011 and 2017, we had tens of thousands of multinational terrorists fighting against you. And you know that there is an enemy. You can see the enemy. There is visible enemy you can fight. So therefore, the popularity of the government, in my opinion, increased between 2011 to 2017 because the people saw the government as its protector against and, and what happened after 2017 Kevok? why did it after, change then because, after, after, uh, we we all know or certainly i know and i'm sure our other co-hosts know that it was not i used to it's true i used the word civil war earlier but uh, that was a sort of euphemism we, we we knew perfectly well that these rebel groups were supported by the west but why, why do you identify 2017 as the moment when this changed yeah, in 2017, Trump ended the regime change war, timber September, and he uh, imposed the draconian sanctions on the Syrian people called the Caesar Act. And now we have this Keptagon Act and the uh, Non-Normalization Act and all these acts that are coming by, by the United States against Syria. Now the people in Syria cannot see an enemy because these sanctions are invisible. When you have a terrorist that is fighting against your infrastructure, bombing your hospitals, you know who is your enemy. But when there are sanctions, the people cannot see a visible enemy. So the people are now asking the government, I need food, I need electricity, I need drinking water, I need the basic necessities that the government cannot secure. And the problem with the Syrian government is, and I compare it to the dinosaur, because its movements are very slow and it's not able to communicate with the people and try to tell them what is wrong with the situation. Yeah, they, they make some programs and they say, yeah, the Americans are occupying this and that. So what is your solution for that? If you can't liberate your gas pipelines from the United States, then what is the solution? Where are your allies? The people are asking questions, right, in Syria. So there is, in my opinion, um, increasing anger by the Syrian people uh, and frustration against the government for being incapable of securing these basic needs. Because at the end of the day, when you have a child who is three, four years old and you have to secure a bread or a milk and you cannot do that, and then you ask your government to do something about it and the government cannot do that, as much as the government starts explaining to you the geopolitical situation, you're not gonna have any positive sentiments toward that because for you, the priority is your family and the priority is your child. So yeah, it's a very difficult situation. So guys, if anyone wants to help Syria, we have to keep speaking about the sanctions that uh, I would say. You're absolutely right, Kivol. The sanctions are, um in place and uh, uh, Lachlan's first rule of international relations is that uh, once sanctions are imposed uh, it takes many years or even decades for them to be lifted even after even decades or years after they have John if I can in ask, and go ask. ahead Peter and then and then Mikhail van der Gallian wants to speak go ahead Peter fascinating um, description of what's going on what was going on and what is going on now in Syria uh, what is the impact of the of, um, of Syria being brought back into the Arab fold because we have Western sanctions, but we have also, as has been observed here, uh, Syria is being welcomed back. I mean, what is the tension there and reestablishing diplomatic relations, people-to-people um, uh, -people relations? How does that impact trade and um, the economy in general? Because I mean, obviously, Syria wants to be brought back into the fold, but it needs to get something from it. What is it getting uh, other than just um, uh, diplomatic recognition? Go ahead, Kavok. 
up until this moment, uh, it seems that uh, the situation is still stuck in the diplomatic recognition that Assad is here to stay. Uh, unfortunately, according to under the Caesar Act, the United States is able to uh, blackmail and impose even sanctions on third party companies and third party nations who are dealing with Syria uh, economically. Uh, after the earthquake, for example, there was a um, temporary, temporary uh, pause for uh, the personal transactions to Syria if you want to send some money to your family and uh, or to uh, non-governmental humanitarian organizations and I live in Germany I tried it in every possible way through bank transactions or through Western Union or any other uh, companies and all 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 the possibilities were rejected because of the sanctions despite the fact that they say they, they paused it you're not able to even to send a thousand dollar to syria so the the syrian central bank is bankrupted they don't have any uh hard currencies they don't have euros they don't have dollars the regional countries especially saudi arabia and the uae are trying their best with the with Washington to lift the sanctions. Up until this moment, this was uh, uh, not successful because the United States says that they have a step by step uh, approach towards Syria, and Syria has to compromise in order for the United States to start lifting the sanctions. And by compromise, the United States wants from Syria to change its foreign policy approach. So the entire situation in Syria started because of the sins that Syria didn't commit, and not the sins that Syria. Commit. It wasn't about democracy, human rights, political uh, freedoms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which all agree in Syria that we need more freedoms. However, we also agree that the foreign policy approach of Syria is correct uh, in the region because it is based on the national uh, security, independence, and sovereignty uh, of the country. Now, the Saudis are trying to invest in Syria, the uh, UAE are trying to invest in Syria, but everything is connected to the dollar. We don't have still um, transactions happening in yuan or in ruble in Syria or in, in, in the region so that Syria can uh, deal with the regional countries with different currencies. And the dollar, as, as, you, as you may know, the only way to bring dollar to Syria is by black uh, uh, suits or in, in uh, uh, privately by hand. And this is how we send money to Syria. Um, up until this moment, I do not see that the Arab, the return of the Syria to the Arab League had tangible um, positive impact. In the contrary, the dollar before, I would say, uh, the Arab, Arab League summit was around uh, 8,500 lira per dollar, and now today it's 10,000. So the situation is uh, deteriorating, and it needs um, more pressure from Saudi Arabia and uh, the UAE because the priority of the Saudis and the UAE is that they found that as much as they fight Syria, Syria is going closer to Iran and they don't want that. So they changed their approach from the hard approach, which is fighting Assad through proxies and these Islamists in Syria into the soft approach, which is trying to persuade Assad to rebalance his relationship between the Arabic country and Iran. And I think Assad is perfectly willing to do that. For a very long time, Syria has never been a client state to Iran or to Russia. But the war and the existential threat on Damascus has forced Damascus to put all its eggs in the basket of Russia and Iran because ISIS was knocking on the door of Damascus. ISIS was actually in Damascus. They were in Yarmouk camp. And there was a plan by Bandar bin Sultan, the former head of the Saudi intelligence, to assassinate Assad in 2013. And this was um, revealed by Hamad bin Jassim, the former foreign minister of Qatar, in 2017 and 2020 during his interviews on a national Qatari TV. Um, it's, uh, it's Jim here. I, I can see Tom running against us, so I'm not, I'm not looking for a lengthy answer. But... Do you see BRICS playing any role in the coming, say, 10 to 15 years, even maybe 20 years? Actually, I'm not an expert on the BRICS. Uh, however, I would say that uh, Syria uh, has uh, expressed its intention to join the BRICS. But uh, why would the BRICS accept Syria? Because Syria will be a burden on the BRICS. It, it's always about mutual benefits, right? Syria cannot present anything to the BRICS countries in terms of the, its industry or in terms of agriculture or any sort of uh, manufacturing uh, process, right? Syria's economy is, has collapsed completely. 
And as much as the government is trying uh, to fix it, they're just doing cosmetic uh, reforms. This is um, partly because of the incompetence of some of the officials in Syria, but also partly because of the sanctions. And um, I do not see that the BRICS can play an instrumental role in Syria before uh, the Syrian territory is clean, uh, cleansed from uh, the, all these militias we have. In Idlib alone, over 60,000 uh, multinational uh, terrorists. Where are these terrorists are going to go? Like uh, we have people from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Saudi Arabia, and those are the leaders of these uh, militant groups there. And they have a very long experience in fighting the Uyghurs. They're around 15,000 in, in Idlib. So before solving the military situation in Syria, every talk about reconstruction, bringing Syria into BRICS or into the Arab League is just a, a, a pen on a paper. It's an ink on a paper. It, Syria has to restore its sovereignty on every inch of Syria, restore its fuel and gas pipelines, start reconstructing so that the uh, industry can move on. Let's remember, guys, Syria has one of the best wheat in the world. Syria has one of the best cotton in the world. And before the war, Aleppo was considered a regional economic hub and regional economic power. And there was the biggest, the largest uh, cancer uh, free cancer treatment hospital in the Middle East, which the UK and the US backed terrorists blew it up completely. So Syria is standing on, on no legs at the moment. They need their economy restored, and then we can speak about BRICS or the Arab League. Uh, Michael van der Gallien, I believe you wanted to uh, ask a last question, perhaps to Kabor. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I actually, I don't have a question. I have a point to make. And that is that um, one of the dangers that I hear in these conversations that we're having, we are having them, the Syrians are having them, the Western pro-inventionism -invention, party, let's call it like that. They all rely on moralism, on what is ethical. And so they say we should, in, we should invade Syria, we should do something in Syria because Assad is a dictator, right? That's the argument they are using to sell it to Western audiences. And at the same time, we are saying we shouldn't do it because look at how terrible actually the results are and how terrible it is for the people there. And then, of course, the Syrians themselves also point at the destruction and say, isn't this terrible? But actually, if you think about foreign policy, I, I think, John, you will probably agree with me on this. Moralism isn't that important. The number one issue should be how are our interests served? So if we look at uh, Syria, for example, our interests aren't actually served with chaos in Syria. That's the argument I think we should be making that the reason we don't want anti in, uh, any in interventionism is that it ends up hurting us. It creates a host of problems. We don't want, we don't want uh, those problems to, to exist. And so I think that moralism is a very dangerous path for us to walk on. It's much better for us to say, okay, these are the actual results of interventionism, and this is why we shouldn't do it, because it damages our own interests. What the US and Europe are doing in Syria and in Ukraine they try to sell it as it's something that is good. And then we try to sell it as something that is morally bad. But actually, the real point is, folks, it doesn't work. It is co it's contra-effective. It pr produces a result that's actually dangerous to us in the long run. What do you think I, about that, John? I think that I, I completely agree with that. And uh, I've often attacked uh, moralism, uh, both in foreign policy and in internal policy or at least what pretends to be moralism. Uh, in fact, the phenomenon that you're referring to, uh, Michael, is uh, condemnation and accusation. Uh, it's not, yes, you can call it moralism, but it's actually just condemnation and accusation. Uh, the, the moralists always see evil uh, in the other person. They never see any evil in themselves. Uh, and that, of course, is the opposite of, of proper morality, because in proper morality, we also question our own uh, motives and our own actions. But you're absolutely right, Michael, to say that uh, uh, um, re realism and reality is a much better guide because it's very intoxicating, isn't it, to think of ourselves as morally superior to Assad or to uh, Putin or Saddam Hussein or whoever. Uh, but in fact, the question should be, as you say, what does this produce in terms of good or, or evil? I mean, good or bad in terms of interests. So that was a, that, thank you very much for that last uh, remark, Michael. I, I say last remark because the time is up. Uh, Vanessa has left us. We're immensely grateful. I know, uh, although unfortunately we can't say it to her. Um, I want to get Vanessa back uh, for a future space because 
uh, as you all know, you, the co-hosts and the listeners, Vanessa and I are both British, but we have both also been the victims of the uh, 2019 uh, Counter-Terrorism Act in Britain, which was voted, uh, Peter and Lavelle, you may not know this, it was voted in the wake of the Skripal attacks. Uh, both of us were held uh, at uh, ports of entry, in my case, Gatwick Airport, and questioned by counter-terrorism police. Uh, it sounds absolutely incredible, but it's true. And so I'd love to get Vanessa back for a, a space on uh, the totalitarianism of the British. She mentioned, uh, Vanessa mentioned in her talks, the specific role of the British. Uh, for instance, she mentioned this guy, James Le Mesurier, in the creation of the White Helmets. Uh, we all know, I think, about the role of the Americans. We know that uh, the CIA and the other American intelligence agencies play a huge role. And of course, the Pentagon and the State Department play a huge role in these uh, dirty uh, tricks and in these regime change operations. Uh, but in spite of the fact that Britain is no longer uh, a, a superpower, as it was for so many centuries, uh, nonetheless, Britain continues to play a, a very dangerous and, and negative role, including, as I say, against its own citizens. So, Jeremy Nell, Michael van der Gali, and Peter Lavelle, thank you so much again. It's a great pleasure. And, thank um, you, John. Good work, John. Thank, thank you, you to John. all our listeners. Thank you to all our listeners. Uh, FBDinternational.com, FBD underscore INTL for Twitter. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again at the same time next Wednesday. All the best, everyone. Goodbye. All the best. Bye.